What's up, quarantines? Coming at you live again, not live for you, to uh, have a brief lecture and one-way discussion about um, Cold War foreign policy um, leading up to Vietnam. So, um, just real quick before we get into it, I, I took a poll and learned that 1% of people in the tent were angry when it collapsed. <laughs> yeah, I know. You gotta do what you gotta do to get by in these crazy times. Okay. Um, all right, let's get into some history here. So, um, curriculum note, which is almost funny to discuss because the curriculum is, is wild now, right? Um, but just today, we're going to be talking about the foreign policy in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, like from a strictly foreign policy Cold War perspective, okay? So um, tomorrow, we're going to, I'm going to record another lecture on the civil rights movement in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so like, we'll be looking at the same time period from two different perspectives. So today is a foreign policy perspective. Tomorrow will be more of like a domestic perspective. Um so before spring break, which turned into to coronacation, um, we were talking about the Cold War from a dom domestic policy perspective. So if you remember, we talked about um, the Red Scare, the second Red Scare. We talked about McCarthyism and how all of those fears of communism were, were um, affecting us domestically. And so today we're going to talk about that Cold War, but from an international perspective. So we're going to talk about it from a foreign policy perspective. Now, Specifically, the way this lecture is going to be set up, and I linked you the notes, or I copied my notes into the little thing on Canvas there, so you can see like how I'm going to follow along. But basically, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Cold War from each president's each presidency. Um, now, the overarching thing about Cold War foreign policy was dominated by this idea of the domino theory, that if one country became communist, that all the countries around it would also fall to communism, just like if you stack dominoes and flick them over, then they all fall. Um, and so the fear was that if if one area was communist, everywhere around them would become communist, and like that communism would spread across the globe. Now, um, the whole idea about stopping that domino theory was by containing the spread of communism. And so the bottom line about today is going to be containment. That is, oh, that is the overarching foreign policy throughout the entirety of the Cold War is containment. How do we contain the spread of communism? Um, and, you know, if you were like to dump the illustration, I always say, is if you were to dump a ball of water onto a desk and you want to stop the water from spreading onto the floor, then you would get it at its edges, right? So like containment is like trying to get the, the communism at its edges to contain that spread of communism. And so that's the name of the game for presidents in the Cold War is containing the spread of communism. Um, so that starts with Truman. So Truman, again, we're going to talk about how communism, how the containment strategy uh, to contain the spread of communism spread out for each president, starting starting with Truman. So Truman was president in 1945, uh, you know, at the end of the Cold War, or, sorry, at the end of World War II. Truman was president, and um, so he's going to be the guy who's going to kick off the Cold War for us. Now, he dispatches uh, a person to um, the Soviet Union named George Kennan, and George Kennan goes to the Soviet Union, and he takes a look around, and he sends Truman back a telegram. It's called the Long Telegram, because it was really long. Seriously. And so, um, in this Long Telegram, George Kennan talks about the Soviet Union as a super insecure entity, right? Like, they are, they're not secure, they don't have um, they're very fear-driven, and so therefore they're going to be consistently expansionist because they're going to be afraid and insecure of their borders. So they're going to keep on trying to expand this policy to expand communism. And so our job is going to need to be to attack that expansion to to contain the spread of communism. So the idea of containment comes from this long telegram comes from George Kennan, and again, it dominates American foreign policy throughout the entirety of the Cold War, basically. We have to contain the spread of communism. And so Truman does that with the Truman Doctrine. He issues this Truman Doctrine and says, like, we're going to support free people. Whatever free people need, specifically in Turkey and Greece, what do free people need to combat communism? Are there people in Turkey and Greece who are resisting 
communist rule, then we're going to support them however they need support. Money, guns, whatever, right? We're going to send support to them to resist their spread of to spread of communism in Turkey and Greece. And especially Greece. Greece is the cradle of democracy. Like we can't have Greece becoming a communist country. That's where that's where democracy was born. So the Truman Doctrine is all about like helping resist communist rule. In, specifically in Turkey and Greece, right? But that's not the only way we resist the spread of communism. Truman also enacted the Marshall Plan, um, which gave economic assistance to European countries. And that makes sense because at the end of World War II, Europe was like economically decimated, which makes sense, right? And so um, Truman sends, and in in, with the Marshall Plan, sends a lot of economic aid, economic assistance to Europe to try and help them out. And um, if you were here or we were in person i would ask you you know why what i mean what's the point how does sending economic assistance to europe stop the spread of communism how is that a tool of containment and you know think about it right like places who are people who are wealthy or places that are very rich they don't become communists that's because communism and revolutions and revolutionary ideas is really an act of desperation right i mean if you are having a hard time feeding your family you're struggling you're poor then communism appeals to you. If you are winning in the system, right? If you're winning in a capitalist system, you don't want to become communist because you're winning. Like you, you like communism, or sorry, you like capitalism. You're wealthy, you're doing good. Why would you overthrow a system that you benefit from? And so economic aid to people resisting poverty is really a tool of, of containment, right? Like if people are benefiting from a capitalist system, they're not going to overthrow that system. They're going to continue to operate within it. So um, stopping the spread of communism in the form of economic aid, which econo which the Marshall Plan was offered to the Soviet Union as well, but they, they just refused it because from the Soviets' perspective, that's economic imperialism. And, you know, this is really a, this is a crash course in foreign policy, and we're glossing over a lot of things here. And I will link you guys later this week after. I will link you guys some more information that if you want to read more about this. I'm going to link you guys like just some general things about the 50s, 60s, and seven, late 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s to if you want to learn more, do more with it. Um, I'm sorry that we're just like kind of in a position where we're just going over the major highlights here. So moving right along. Um, Truman's policy of containment from an economic perspective was the Marshall Plan. Truman's policy of containment from a military perspective was a big deal, right? First of all, we joined NATO which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO is a peacetime military alliance. Hmm. Somewhere in U.S. history, we've talked about peacetime military alliances. Ah, George Washington, way back when. George Washington said, you know, there are two things he wanted to warn us against in his farewell address. And one of them was political parties, which we promptly ignored. And the other one was peacetime military alliances, which we did not ignore until we joined NATO. And late 40s. So um, now we're in a peacetime military alliance. Specifically, the goal of NATO is to combat communist rule, to combat the Soviet Union, to be protected against Russia. NATO still exists today. NATO is still big time in the news today. NATO is still a very relevant organization. So that all started with Truman, and that's, you know, a tool of containment. We're joining this peacetime military alliance to contain the spread of communism, to help each other contain the spread of communism. So um, also, from a military perspective, Truman is the president who gets involved in the um, Korean War. So we're going to direct our attention to this little whiteboard I got here. Coffee. Um, so uh, let's take a look at this. So this is the Korean Peninsula. It's kind of hard to see. Let me see. All right, this is the Korean Peninsula. Um, and I really didn't think this computer thing through. <laughs> you can't read any of this. This is North Korea, and this is South Korea, and they're divided by the 38th parallel. Now, the 38th parallel was established after World War II because when, um, you know, when the Allies won World War II, the whole world was divided up between the Allies, the France, um, France, Great Britain, Soviet Union, and the United States. So um, after World War II ended, the Soviet Union got North Korea to control and America took over South, country, South Korea to control, and the 38th parallel was the line that divided those two things. Uh, friendly reminder, North Korea is bordered by China, which is a communist country then and now. And so um, 
North Korea is communist, South Korea is not. Does it sound familiar? Okay, because here's how the war went. Um, fighting broke out along the 38th parallel. There's still some, like, honestly, historical inconsistencies on how the war, like, actually started. Um, South Korea blames North Korea, North Korea blames South Korea, and so, regardless, fighting broke out along the 38th parallel, and so, you know, both sides became expansionist. Um, North Korea was trying to expand to South Korea, and, uh, we have to contain it. Again, this is all about containing the spread of communism. So, um... In our efforts to contain the spread of communism, we send support to South Korea to help fight against North Korea. And the guy who was in charge of that support was um, General MacArthur. And MacArthur is super successful. You know, I mean, he's winning. We win. Uh, um, South Korea is, is winning the war. And we beat North Korean forces all the way up to this dotted line here. Now, no, we're getting close to China. And China didn't like that. You know, China's like, you know what? You're getting really close to our border. If you continue to get closer and closer to, to our national security, then we're going to get involved and we're going to fight on behalf of North Korea. And General McCarthy and MacArthur in America basically ignored those warnings. And when they got close enough to China's border, China did just that. They, they invaded. They got involved on the side of North Korea. And in a really, like, pretty embarrassing military defeat... Um, Americans' forces were beat back, back to all the way to the 38th parallel. MacArthur was mad. You know, MacArthur is like, we need more resources to fight now. We're not just fighting against North Koreans. We're also fighting against China. Hey, Mr. Truman, President Truman, we need more support. We need, um, more guns. We need more troops. We need to escalate this war so that we can fight against China. We can can beat them back and do what we need to do to stop the spread of communism. And Truman, um, interestingly, was like, no. You know, Truman understood that a war with China would mean a war with the Soviet Union because China was also communist. And Truman didn't want to get into this overt war. We just got out of World War II. We, he didn't want to fight another war like that. So he said no. Truman was not willing to escalate the war in, in Korea. And MacArthur got mad. And MacArthur went public. He published all of these things in newspapers, you know, accusing Truman of being soft on communism and um, publicly said, like, he's he's not a lot giving the military what it needs to fight back against these communists. And um, he, uh, Truman was, well, Truman was like, hey, MacArthur, that's insubordination. You're fired, right? So MacArthur lost his job. Truman withdrew forces. That's basically the end of Korea. And if it sounds anticlimactic, it was, right? I mean, we started at 38th parallel with North Korea being communist, South Korea being not communist. We fought, like, for a while. And then the war ended at the 38th parallel with North Korea being communist and South Korea being not communist. And that's exactly what it is today, right? North Korea is still a communist country. South Korea is still not. The 38th parallel is still the line that separates them. It's exactly the same as it was at the end of World War II. We, there was just, like, a little skirmishes in between. And... It was a war. I mean, people died and fought in that war. Like, that's that's significant. But also, it just kind of ended where it started. And um, it did damage because MacArthur, in calling Truman soft on communism, what he did is he really hurt the Democratic Party. You know, Truman was a Democrat. And now the whole Democratic Party was being labeled as soft on communism in this time where people are super afraid of communism. And so, therefore, you know, come 1952... Um, the Republican Party wins the presidency. So let's move on to the next president. So just to recap Truman, Truman started this idea of containment. He's the one who dispatched George Kennan in the long telegram to, to even introduce the idea of containment. He issues the Marshall Plan, which economically contains communism. He introduced the Truman Doctrine, which supported free people in Turkey and Greece. And then he also joined NATO and was involved in the Korean War Although he limited the Korean War a lot, too. So uh, the damage is done for the Democratic Party. You know, they're labeled as soft on communism. Everybody's afraid of communism. So this guy named Eisenhower wins the presidency, and, and, um, and he's a Republican, right? So Eisenhower, as far as containment goes, he didn't do a whole, whole lot. I mean, Eisenhower, from a foreign policy perspective, issued the Eisenhower Doctrine, in which he basically took the, the fight to contain communism to the Middle East. So, like, all the involvement we have in the Middle East now, you can kind of thank Eisenhower for that. 
Um, he was the first president to, to specifically try to contain communism um, in the Middle Eastern region of the world. And so that's the Eisenhower Doctrine. Containment, it's still containment. Containment is the name of the game. We're containing communism. That's the goal. It's still containment, but for Eisenhower, it's specifically containment in the Middle East. So that brings us, you know, and Eisenhower did a lot of things. I'm just a side note. We'll talk about it a little more tomorrow, but Eisenhower is significant. He also passed the Interstate Highway Act. You know, it was a pretty big deal for a Republican to maintain the continuity of New Deal programs. I mean, Eisenhower is a big deal, important guy. I'm just, we're just going to move on kind of quickly because from a foreign policy perspective and from a containment of communism perspective, um, Eisenhower's big thing was Eisenhower Doctrine. Um, Eisenhower was a two-term Republican president. In 1960, Kennedy was elected. And John Kennedy was, um, you know, he became president in a time where um, communism had spread specifically to Cuba. And we're, we're here in Florida. We know Cuba's really close to to us. And so people were like really freaking out that uh, Cuba was communist. And so, you know, there's some cultural understanding of Cuba here. Like Fidel Castro took over. Um, Cuba became a communist country. Cuba's still communist today. But, you know, here in Florida, we, we kind of know a little bit about that because there's a big Cuban influence on our culture in Florida. So Cuba is communist. Um, Fidel Castro is the leader. And in Eisenhower's administration, they had concocted a plan to combat against that communist revolution. And the idea was, if we take some Cuban nationals, some people who fled from the Cuban, from Cuba whenever Fidel Castro took over, fled from the Castro re regime, um, we put them back into Cuba and they will storm the beaches of Cuba and incite a rebellion, right? And the people of Cuba will like join them and fight back against this Castro regime. And then America will send air support and like extra support and support this rebellion, this Cuban began, Cuban led rebellion against communism and the Castro regime in Cuba. We'll look like the heroes. And so um, Kennedy adopted, he inherited this plan from the previous administration. And Kennedy was like, not loving it, to be honest with you. At first he was like really skeptical with the whole thing. His whole thing was then what? You know, okay, so Cuba becomes not communist anymore. These, these, rebel, these rebels fight back against the Castro regime. And then what? You know, then what happens? Um, and so K Kennedy had his reservations, but he went along with it anyway because it was very early on into his presidency when this was happening. And um, so he did it, right? And it was a disaster. The Cuban nationals stormed the beaches. Um, no Cuban people supported them. Fidel Castro found, you know, was on top of it and knew about the plan right away, squashed the rebellion. And um, Kennedy called off air support because it was a failure, you know? And so what we basically left those people stranded on the beaches of Cuba when it was, you know, we put them there to incite this rebellion and then we left them there to get either captured or killed. And Castro famously came over TV and he said that he slaughtered them like pigs. And so this invasion became known as the Bay of Pigs invasion because Castro said he slaughtered these Cuban nationals like pigs. And um, it was it was very embarrassing for America. You know, I mean, it was, it was a big, from a like PR perspective, it's a huge blunder. And from a humanitarian perspective, we just left those people to die. And Kennedy, this is a pretty bad start to his presidency, right? Kennedy does not look good coming out of this Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, and, and Cuba is still communist, you know? We're supposed to be containing the spread of communism, and we didn't. We failed. Cuba is now a communist country, um, and it's going to stay that way because we couldn't fight back against it. Um, so Kennedy goes about his presidency trying to recover from that uh, disaster, and um, people start freaking out about Cuba again when it, we find out that um, Russia is trying to send Cuba some nukes, right? And again, Cuba is super close to Florida. Um, so people were really freaking out. Like, what are we going to do? You know, if Cuba becomes a nuclear power right there, right near America, like, we're this is scary. Like, we're, we're in trouble. And so Kennedy, when he finds out about the, um, about the nukes that are being sent to Cuba, he immediately blockades the island, sends, sends, the American Navy, you know, just like the Anaconda plan back in the Civil War, he blockades 
the island of Cuba. Nobody can get in. Nobody can get out. We are not allowing nuclear weapons to get there. And, you know, this is scary because um, Cuban missiles are being sent to Cuba from Russia on a boat. And now our boats are blockading the island. And have you guys ever played chicken? You know, like where like two people run at each other and then until someone like moves. And so there's like, oh, we're running, we're running, we're running. And the person who moves loses or wins, depending on how you think about it. But so anyway, what we have on our hands in the Cuban Missile Crisis is nuclear chicken, right? I mean, like there's an American boat and then there's a Russian boat with a nuke. Right. And here it is sailing at the American boat. And like, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. And everybody's watching this, right? Like it's, it's on national television. Everybody is just watching nuclear chicken. If you can imagine the tension and imagine being Kennedy, right? Like Kennedy is like holding his ground against this nuclear weapon sailing towards his ship and here it comes, and it's chicken, and oh my gosh, at the last second, the Russian ship turns around and goes back to Russia. So Cuba never got nukes, and Kennedy, I mean, whew, Kennedy comes out of that looking like, like, wow, that was really impressive. You were tough on communism. You were tough. You held your ground. You did not allow the Cubans to obtain nuclear weapons. And it was a big, big victory for the Kennedy administration um, and a big, big victory for the containment of at least nuclear communism, right? And so good for them, um, good for Kennedy and uh, super stressful for everybody else, right? I mean, like that was, it's, it's became known as brinkmanship. Like we're, we're taking this nuclear war to the very brink. Like it's like we are on the brink of nuclear war, right? Brinkmanship. I mean, that close playing nuclear chicken and and the oceans off the coast of Florida. It was it was really crazy. Um, but Kennedy, you know, comes out of that looking pretty good. Um, the last thing Kennedy does, you know, he's not president for very long. He gets assassinated in 1963. He's elected in 1960. But he does send some troops to Vietnam. You know, he's actually people don't realize it. Kennedy is actually the first president who sends troops to Vietnam. And so we're going to get into the Vietnamese conflict, um, but we're gonna take a break first, okay? So I'm going to I'm gonna end this video and then I'm going to upload a separate video specifically just about Vietnam because I've been talking for a long time and um, you know I'm sure you guys need a quick break. So do some stretches, do what you need to do, um, and then whenever you will come back, uh, watch the next video about Vietnam. That'll be specifically about that one, okay? So so break time, brain break, yay!